making a steam plant using three Cotswold Heritage steam engines. This is the final episode, part 13, Engine Trouble. And here is a steam plant currently running on steam and performing quite well. The best runner is the Perseus on the right hand side, the blue engine, followed by the Ariel in the middle which is fine but a little bit clunky, and then the one that's not running too well on the left hand side is the one called the Isis. The part of the base below the crankshaft is rapidly filling up with water and periodically throughout the run I had to keep draining this using a syringe. So where's the water coming from? It's coming from the piston rod gland. From what I can gather this seems to have been a long standing problem with this engine. There are a few marks on the gland nut where some previous attempt at retightening it has failed. In the first episode, I think it was the first episode when I first ran these engines, I did notice that this one was a bit wheezy, and I would think that's because the pistons won. Due to either excessive running, or more likely lack of lubrication, and that's also why the piston rod gland is worn too. Tightening the gland nut on this type of engine is difficult, particularly when it's a nut like this. It's much better if it's just a ring with lots of little holes in it, so you can put a rod in there to move it around. Anyway, I couldn't really do the job properly, so I'm going to take the engine apart. Not just to look at the gland problem, I'm also going to change the piston ring, because from what I can tell of the sound and feel of this engine, which has negligible power, the piston ring is worn out. When I removed the cylinder head, I noticed some sealant. This could be the latex type sealant, which is acceptable. I don't think it's silicone rubber. In the previous clip I showed how I broke the seal using a very sharp craft knife. And in this clip I'm using an allen key to remove the bolt that holds the piston to the piston rod. Once I removed the piston, this is what I found. The piston ring is very odd. It doesn't feel like a Viton piston ring, nor is it a silicone rubber piston ring. It just feels like an ordinary neoprene one, and it's very worn. I didn't have any piston rings like this, either of the correct size or the correct diameter. So I quickly went up to Blackgate's Engineering and bought some of them. While I was there, I also got some 3 sixteenths of an inch diameter O-rings for another job. The only minor problem is, this piston ring doesn't fit. Blackgate's Engineering didn't have any piston rings in stock, the same size as the original. These are the type of piston rings I normally use, so it's a very quick job to mount the piston on a mandrel, and this is a 2BA stud which is 3 sixteenths of an inch diameter, just like the hole in the piston, and with the entire assembly mounted in my three jaw chuck in the Boxford lathe, I'm using a parting tool in the tool post to machine the groove to the correct width and depth. For an o-ring to work successfully in a piston like this, the groove needs to be the correct depth and exactly the right width, and for successful operation of the o-ring in a cylinder, these dimensions are very important. There's a wealth of information available online. The big brass nut that you can see that doesn't look very straight at all is an old brass union nut that I'm using just to fill the distance on the stud between the plain part and the threaded part. In no time at all the brass piston is cut to the correct width and correct depth to take the o-ring and to confirm this the easiest way to do that is to just hold the o-ring in the groove and see what it feels like. And it feels well sort of groovy, it feels okay. So that's this little job done, time to reassemble the engine. This next part of the job is important. You must lubricate the groove in the piston before fitting the o-ring. I'm using my normal lubrication mixture which is mainly steam oil, if ever it comes out of the oil can. Ah, there it goes. With the piston refitted to the piston rod and the crosshead in place, it's time to pack the gland. I'm using graphited yarn for this. After I repacked the gland and tightened the gland nut, it was time to put some compressed air into the engine to see how it goes. Well, it's running. It sounds a little bit like a machine gun crossed with a pneumatic drill, but it's running. The engine feels slightly tight because suddenly now it does have a piston ring. The main reason why this engine is making such a horrible noise is that the air has been admitted to the cylinder very late. Now, I don't know why this has happened. I think the eccentric has slipped. And this could have been caused by a variety of things. I think it's been caused because now the engine has compression and there's a lot more pressure staying in the steam chest which puts more pressure on the valve 
so making it more difficult for the eccentric to move the valve up and down easily. So I think what's happened is the eccentric sheave has slipped around the crankshaft slightly. You can clearly see in this clip that air is not being admitted until the piston's well on its way down the cylinder. What you need to aim for with a steam engine is early admission, but on an engine with maybe a small flywheel like this, admission just on top dead centre is permissible, but certainly not after top dead centre. As you can see, I reconnected the steam pipes and I raised steam and the engine's running on steam at the moment. I think I'd better shut the drain valve on the displacement lubricator. And as you can clearly see in this clip, the engine is rotating, but it's not running very smoothly. When you watch the three engines running together, you will see that the Perseus on the right hand side is really revolving smoothly. And look at the engine on the left hand side, it's very lumpy. It's only just making it at the end of each stroke. As I'm pumping water into the boiler, the pressure's dropped and the engine stopped. So here I'm starting it up again. And I can really feel now that it is so far out, I think I'm going to adjust the timing. So I move straight on to the next section, adjusting the timing on a very small steam engine. So I shut off the gas and let the steam plant cool, connected the airline, and here I'm using an Allen key to make an adjustment to the position of the eccentric sheave on the crankshaft. Luckily this engine has a hole in the side of the eccentric strap and you can put an allen key into this hole and get right through to the grub screw in the eccentric sheave. It just makes adjustment much quicker. After a few attempts that I haven't shown here, finally I get the timing to the perfect position as far as I'm concerned. On most model steam engines, the highest point of the lobe on the eccentric sheave is the part where the allen key goes in. And the highest point of the eccentric sheave needs to be set at 90 degrees to the crank pin. And in an ideal world with perfect engineering, this would be okay, but often you have to move it just off that position one way or another. If you move it one way, you're retarding the timing. If you move it the other way, you're advancing it. You need to aim for it to be letting the steam in just before top dead center. That cushions all the movements. The engine runs a lot better, as you can see here, and it's a lot quieter. So the very last job on this steam plant, which has been quite an enjoyable experience, is to refit the steam pipe for the last time. Raise some steam and here it is running. Everything's running very smoothly once again, but this time the engine on the left has got quite a lot of power and it's not taking quite as much steam as it did in the first place. So that's it, the end of the series. The three engine Cotswold Heritage steam plant is now complete. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.